May I first request that you switch your electronic devices to silent mode, please? Thank you. May I now call upon Associate Professor Ho Chi Kong, Master of Tembusu College, to first introduce the Tembusu Conversations, as well as our distinguished guest for tonight, Dr. Lee. Talk Ho, please. Good evening, Mrs. Lim, uh, Honour Speaker, Dr. Lee Kai-Fu, uh, students and uh, college fellows. Uh, I'm Ho Chi Kong, Master of the College and also the Vice Dean of the Yong Suto Conservatory of Music in charge of academic affairs. Uh, it's been a while since we are in this room without our mask on, so welcome to our maskless symposium. So I want to extend a very warm welcome to you, you know, to today's uh, inaugural Tempusu Conversations, uh, which is a flagship event initiated by Mrs. Lim, our rector. Under the invitation of Mrs. Lim, uh, the Tempusu Conversations brings you experts, practitioners in areas of innovative technologies, uh, finance, geopolitical and social shifts to share their exclusive insights and perspectives with our college. Now tonight's speaker is very special is Dr. Lee Kai-Fu, who wrote the seminal book, AI Superpowers, and the new world order in which he predicted China's rise to become an artificial intelligence superpower. Now, since the publication of that book this year, you know, he has another new book, that's so why I'm making a plug for Dr. Lee's book. Um, AI 2041, 10 visions of our future, where he shares further predictions on a set of advanced technologies that will greatly impact the world. Now this evening, Dr. Lee will share his insights on AI development, deep technology, and technological revolutions in areas such as quantum computing annual energy and life sciences. So without further ado, let us warmly welcome Dr. Lee on stage. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be the um, first speaker in this uh, series. And uh, I want to talk to you about the amazing times in which you live and the opportunities afforded by the, what I call the fourth industrial revolution. So um, in 1928, uh, sorry, in 2018, I predicted that China would become an AI superpower. And that was quite controversial at the time. And this is a graph from the book where my predictions were that China would advance itself in a number of areas in artificial intelligence. And today, it looks like that has happened. So hopefully, my next book will be equally accurate uh, in, in its predictions. And if you look at AI, maybe just a few words on what is AI. A when I say AI, I'm talking about um, narrow machine intelligence that collects a large amount of data in a particular domain and becomes incredibly good in optimizing some objective function. So <clears throat> if you were an e-commerce provider, you would recommend things that the user is likely to buy with the objective function being maximizing your revenue. And if you were a social network provider, uh, you would be maximizing user interaction and their likelihood of clicking and watching content. And AI is so good at that because it collects data from hundreds of millions of people and learns your similarity, to, your similarity to them, and based on your previous uh, preferences, it can predict at what kind of content you would like. That's the internet type of AI. Of course, a bank can use it to, based on many people who borrow money, and it can train a model of people who actually return the money versus a model of people who defaulted. For new applicants, if you're more like a defaulter, they don't give you the money. If you're more like a repayer, they will give you the money. And then this can advance itself to <clears throat> perception AI, where AI can see and hear like people, and it can move to autonom automation AI, autonomous AI, where AI can manipulate and move. And these are developed um, in parallel, and we're now seeing all type, all four types of AI really all around us. And China became very strong in 
in AI for the reasons described in my first book. <clears throat> Had China has a fantastic engineering education, uh, as does Singapore, of course, and China also has a large number of these engineers. And today, actually, everywhere I go, people talk about the shortage of AI engineers, but China has a surplus. Number two, China has had tough internet entrepreneurs who, in the market with the most users, also build super apps that capture the hours of users each day. So more users times more time means more data, which then, number four here, shows you that the more data trains better models. Uh, one of the key points I make in the book is that in the era of AI, data is the new oil. So the more data you have, the better off you are. And then, of course, China um, actively has a lot of funders of AI, like uh, my own company, as well as supportive government policies. <clears throat> China has about 25 AI unicorns, and we funded about 10 of them. And collectively, they're worth 30 billion US. And they span all kinds of areas um, that you can see on this slide. So hugely successful. And today, uh, in the new book that I wrote last September, I, I predict that China will further extend its technological uh, success from AI to other new areas. And they're listed here, the five key areas. I'll briefly go into each of them and talk about the opportunity that exists uh, for, for China and how it would um, grow. But before I go into these five areas, I want to re-emphasize what a special time you live in. Uh, probably the closest approximation was 120 years ago, when three great inventions changed the next 120 years. And these were electricity, electromagnetic wave, and the combustible engine. They created the automobile industry the, the, and, and the electricity, electrical uh, grid, and the radio, TV, computers, internet, were all built from these revolutions. And they not only created great companies like Ford and General Electric, but they changed the landscape of technology and competition. And everything is different. How people today uh, communicate, play, and work uh, are completely different than 120 years ago, largely enabled by these three inventions and their popularity made by um, practitioners in the United States. We're at a similar opportunity point today. And these are the five technologies that I claim to be as important as electricity. Some of you may be skeptical, so let me quickly go through them. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence, as I said, is a technology that can beat us in every single domain where we can get data within that domain. I mean, isn't that more important than electricity? It is truly part of human intelligence. What we considered impossible is now not just replicated, but beaten by AI, and we see that everywhere. Number two, automation. AI and robotics will take over and replace at, or enhance at least 50% of human jobs within the next 20 years. So jobs will change mark, and, and, and routine jobs will be gone. And we as human race will for the first time be liberated from having to do routine work. Isn't that as big as electricity? Number three is quantum. This is a new way of computing that will solve unsolvable problems on today's classical computers. It will run trillions of times faster and solve problems related to security, encryption, climate, modeling of human beings, um, because it is based on the fundamental uh, principle of quantum mechanics. So it can accurately model uh, anything that exists as life or uh, in, in, in on Earth. So the ability to solve unsolvable problems, I mean, isn't that as big as electricity? Number four is life sciences, where scientists will be able to create life and modify life in a way that's never been done before. This is not medicine, this is not treatment. This is creating a species like a worm that can behave as a fertilizer. It is like doing things like editing a human gene so that we can forever be immune from a certain disease. Isn't that as big as electricity? And lastly, new energy. 
will bring down the cost of energy through new technologies <clears throat> like hydrogen and um, <clears throat> fusion and others that will reduce the cost of energy by 90% in the next 15 years, probably more in the next 20 years, making, making energy almost free. This is not about green. Of course, it is green, but it's, all, it's about uh, low-cost energy. And now collecting these five things together, if you think about the cost of any good today, your phone, your glass, your pen, your chair, it has three basic costs. First, the materials. Second is the labor. Third is the energy. That's the three major costs to making anything. The cost of the material will go down dramatically as life science scientists work on building new materials, one molecule at a time, and not having to make them out of toxic and limited materials like um, fossil fuel. That will bring down the costs. The labor will be replaced by automation. Robots will make future products, thereby dramatically reducing the marginal cost of making a product. And the new energy, as I said, will go down by more than 90%. So if all goods go down by 90% in costs, we as a human race will have the fortune and the ability to make enough goods for everyone, thereby potentially eradicating poverty and hunger from the earth. And isn't that as big as electricity? That's the opportunity that's ahead of us. And it's in the next 20 years, so you were born exactly in the right years to participate in this revolution and also to enjoy the benefits from the revolution. So in the next 15 minutes, <clears throat> I'm going to spend three or four minutes on each one of these technology areas. It will have to be very fast. I'll speak at a very high level, uh, give you an idea. Um, but if you want more details, buy my book. <clears throat> so AI is beating humans in everything we can imagine. I've talked about AI being um, an omni-use technology that can be applied everywhere from internet to business to being able to see and hear to being able to manipulate and move. And, and this will be a tremendous progression that will help us do white collar and blue collar routine work that will liberate us from having to do them. And two big examples is on the left side, on the upper part, we see the blue bars showing AI beating humans in the ability to recognize objects, which created many applications and opportunities, such as uh, inspection of goods in manufacturing, reading of radiology and diagnosis, robots that can see, and cars that can drive themselves. And we at Sinovation invested in many of these companies, creating many unicorns. On the bottom part, we see a more recent breakthrough where the blue bars again show the computer performance in reading comprehension. That's measured as in feed a book to an AI algorithm, ask any questions pertaining to the book, AI will answer the questions better than most people. And that has already happened. If you didn't realize that, you should look it up. That is a huge impact because human language is arguably even more important than human vision because it is the way we communicate and the way we record history and the way we record um, uh, uh, all human knowledge. So the understanding of all human text is phenomenal and that will lead to breakthroughs in speech recognition, machine translation. Search engines will go from one query to a bunch of websites you can click on to one question and get one precise answer. And targeted advertising, this one's a little bit scary, uh, for the same product will be advertised differently to each individual based on that person's uh, needs and preferences. And obviously it has tremendous commercial op opportunities, but it also has many downsides because it is in some ways similar to what Cambridge Analytica did, uh, but much more powerful. This is Cambridge Analytica on steroids, uh, both for the opportunity for doing good and for doing bad. Uh, one of the breakthroughs I mentioned is called self-supervised learning. It is that language thing I talked about at the bottom. Uh, basically, AI that gets better with data. More data, the better. So what if we had infinite data? Well, we'd have the problem of how do you teach an AI with infinite data, with trillions of pieces of data? Well, the answer is 
you don't have to label the data. You don't have to say this is a dog, that's a cat. You just show so much data and tell AI to self-organize its structure so that it can remember, synthesize, and generate data that it hasn't seen before. So essentially, it's reading every book in the history of human race and trying to predict the next sentence within one of those books, having read everything before it and with the nearby context. And when it can be compressed to have a abstract representation, it can then be used to recognize or synthesize or answer questions, leading to tremendous applications. And, and the system would work as scan, read everything in the world and have a conceptual knowledge in a large language model. And that model can be fine-tuned to answer questions, do targeted advertising, recognize speech, translate Arabic to Chinese, and so on and so forth. This has already reached substantial progress. One of the companies we invested in has made such a model, and I was recently in Middle East telling them about this, and they said, well, you don't know Arabic. And in three weeks, the machine learned Arabic um, without, without anyone on the team who knows Arabic. And it actually beat Google in the performance of translating from English to Arabic. And this is all machine learning by itself on a tremendous amount of data. So China is once again uh, participating in this newest AI revolution. If you look at who invented this self-supervised learning, it's American researchers. But who made it practical? It may very well be Chinese. Similarly, who invented the computer vision algorithms, the ones that led to the bar? Americans and Canadians and uh, some British. And, but who made it practical is the Chinese engineers. Going back to my point about China being really the engine of development, execution, and fast growth, um, fueled by a tremendous engineering population and a very hungry and tenacious entrepreneurs with whom I had the fortune to work with. Moving to the second area about robotics. Um, there are many ways to do robotics. You can apply it to transportation, that's autonomous vehicles. Apply it to manufacturing, that's AI for the industrial applications. These are some companies we invest in. And the approach we take is very different, again, from American companies. The American automotive aut autonomous driving is characterized by Waymo, which uh, basically tries to build a better driver than a human then it, tries, then it would apply it everywhere. The problem is that's too hard a problem. The, in China, the approach taken is, let's take a simpler example. Use tremendous engineering and execution uh, to build real working autonomous vehicles in constrained environments for customers who would pay money. And then you collect the data and move to harder problems. So from left to right here, you see the Chinese companies are getting better and better, starting from indoors with autonomous forklifts, then going into autonomous logistics transportation for airports, which is outside, then moving large cargo at ports with these giant trucks, then to trucks that can drive on the highway but not yet in the city. Then in the city for buses, these robo-buses are going on bus routes that might have 20 stops, but it doesn't have to go anywhere. Then it goes to street cleaning, which only drives at night when there are very few pedestrians out. We want to m minimize potential of hitting a human. And there are many other examples. And these companies are growing rapidly, generating more revenue than a typical American counterpart. And I would predict in another two years, we're going to see a number of Chinese autonomous vehicle companies that are widely deployed with um, government um, applications to transportations in cities and in um, highways. On the bottom, you see the various capabilities of AI in manufacturing. I talked about how AI would take over 50% of routine blue collar and white collar work. The blue collar work would be people who currently work in the factories for perhaps for visual inspection on the left side basically using human eyes, and then for muscles and moving, and then for hand-eye coordination, and for dexterity, and more and more complex. Now AI is starting to conquer that, and we as Innovation are looking at the types of workloads that AI can do 
and investing in companies that are gradually taking away the need for routine human labor in the factories. China being the factory of the world has tremendous um, motivation to automate because that's the way to compete with countries that have a lower cost like Vietnam rather than lower the salary, which is not practical anymore. These are some examples of companies we invested in. On the upper right, you see these tiny little carts that coordinate with each other in, a, in, in, in basically a swarm. They never run into each other because they know exactly each other's coordinates. And you see that they can go so fast for very one, important, one very important reason, humans not allowed, right? Uh, if human were to enter, who knows what would happen? Because humans can make errors, humans are unpredictable, but these machines are fully connected like one swarm of bees or um, <clears throat> birds who never run into each other. On the lower right-hand side is something we're quite familiar with today, uh, PCR tests. Here is a giant robot that can, you can see on the lower, lower right of the lower right how fast these arms are moving doing PCR tests, right? A human would be very cautious for the fear of contamination for the fear of making errors, for the fear of squeezing too much or too little liquid. But robots don't make mistakes. They're fast, they work 24 by seven. So this robot can do 120,000 PCR tests per day. And that's how China can do uh, the massive testing that we see uh, happening today. And on the lower left is a non-AI uh, breakthrough. It's a materials breakthrough. This is a, a robot whose fingers are not made with big steel um, construction, but made with these soft materials. It has these fat, bubbly fingers. You can see here it's grasping an egg yolk, something that even human hands cannot do. You can try it tonight if you want. <clears throat> and then um, another important area related to AI is the semiconductor revolution um, and the need for more compute. Uh, people might say, well, why do we need more compute? My iPhone is fast enough. My PC is fast enough. Well, they are, but there are new workloads like AI that is no longer finding today's compute power acceptable. This graph shows um, the most advanced AI applications for that year. The x-axis is the year, and then each blue dot on the graph is a an AI demonstration. So all the things you've heard about, AlphaGo, Alpha, Alpha Fold, Alpha Fold 2, GPT-3, um, are all on this graph. And what you can see is before 2010, the, the AI applications were growing very slowly because AI was not known, was not important. AI was forced to conform and use whatever the fastest computers were available. And computers, between 1960 and 2010 were going, growing at, guess what, 1.5x per year. That's known as Moore's Law, right? So whatever computer Intel or others make, we AI people had to use them, so we better not demand more compute because that's all we're dealt with. But starting 2010, the AI became hot, inventions came out, data became plentiful, they require more computing. AI became hot so that companies like Google and Facebook bought, built $100 million computers and supercomputers were made uh, and GPUs were invented. So we saw a very fast trajectory from 2010 to today. It's growing at seven times per year. And imagine the power of exponentiation, how much more compute is needed next year, the year after, the year after. We're gonna very definitely run out of compute very, very soon. Uh, the Y graph is the amount of compute, and each little tick represents ten, 10 times more compute. So the computers we have are not gonna get us where we need to be if we want AI to advance itself. So what happens here is more ex explicitly, the blue chart shows the CPU, the green chart shows the GPU. So think of it as an overall Moore's law, if you will, that with or without the GPU, we more or less maintained enough progress based on conventional semiconductor chips, a 50% increase per year, which is tremendous already. But what AI needs is the orange picture, and that we don't have. And projecting 2035, we're gonna be off by uh, six, or seven, uh, six or seven orders of magnitude. The computers that NVIDIA 
we'll be able to make by year 2035 on this graph uh, will be a, something like a billion times too slow than the AI scientists. So what are we going to do? Are we going to be able to advance computers by a billion times magically? Well, the answer is yes, and that is by quantum computing. Quantum pro computing provides a completely different way uh, to make computers. Rather than bits, they have qubits. So one of the magical things is that by adding a qubit, you double the capability of a machine. So a machine that has 4,000 qubits, by just adding three qubits to it, 4,003 qubits, you've made a quantum computer that's eight times faster than the one you had last year, thereby enough to to make the AI scientists happy. So if we want AI to advance, then we better push for a quantum computer. If you doubt this, think about who's the most powerful semiconductor company in the world, right? Used to be Intel. That was the PC days. And then, <clears throat> then it was Qualcomm. That was the mobile days. Now it's clearly NVIDIA. These are the AI days. I know that you don't touch and use AI or don't feel like you touch and use AI every day, but this has already happened. NVIDIA became the most powerful semiconductor company because the AI workload is creating value and changing the world. But that's no longer going to be satisfactory because we need quantum. So quantum, as I described, will be the largest shift in computing in human history. I would argue I have argued in AI superpowers that AI would be the most important technology uh, in the history of human race. <clears throat> it's a little bit controversial, but more and more people are accepting it. But just as people are accepting it, I need to correct myself. I would say now, when quantum computer works, that will be the most important technology, eclipsing AI and revolutionizing AI. The day that quantum computers start to work, for any of you who have bitcoins in a classical wallet, be careful. They will be stolen because a quantum computer will break your bit computer pass bitcoin password. Okay? Uh, but if you have a modern wallet, don't worry, you're safe. Uh, but that's just one joke. As, in, as a true, but it's a, it's a small example. But quantum will break all computer security. Every password, everything you use will completely be broken um, until computers start to use quantum encryption then they will be unbreakable, even if you had a quantum computer to break it. That's how amazing this technology is. Quantum will change the future of AI algorithms. Every AI algorithm we have today, including deep learning, is an approximation. It's not an optimal strategy. And having a quantum computer will enable a whole new class of AI algorithms that will completely leave deep learning behind in the dust. That is why Forbes magazine has said the future geopolitical competition in technology will be fought in the labs with brains on whoever figures out quantum first, which is why on these other charts, you see US and China in, in, in investing vigorously into the space. Today, US is ahead, but China is developing also very rapidly. <clears throat> the fourth area is life science. I'm going to pick one specific part of life science, which is healthcare. We all want to live healthier and longer, and the, the, a breakthrough is about to ha a set of breakthroughs are about to happen in healthcare life sciences. First, everything's being digitized, including wearable computing, uh, radiology reports, hospital records, and genetic sequencing. Doctors will no longer be able to digest all of our data to give us the proper treatment. I mean, what doctor can read a gigabyte of genetic code? It's in impossible but computers can do that. And it can also treat people pre in a precision manner. Uh, just like when each of us logs into TikTok or Facebook or YouTube, we see different content because those are designed for us. Uh, when in the future, when we get treatment, we may each get a different treatment even if we have the same illness. That's the power of AI. And it can expand on all kinds of ways of treating existing and new diseases. Secondly, a lot of new technologies are being developed to make new machinery, new medical instruments, new robotic surgery, combining the power of mechanical robotic AI with the need for instruments and machines to become more powerful. With these advancements, and an example would be, think about how blood tests were done when you were little, right? You, were pro you probably had a, someone looking through a microscope, counting white blood cells. 
Now a PCR takes care of it. So we're at a point where these medical devices can be built that are smaller, faster, more accurate, and cheaper. So that will push the revolution one step further. And a number of things that we invest in from the right-hand the right -hand side shows that AI drug discovery is great. It's because AI can read all the medical journals that humans can't and come up with drug candidates that are likely to work. On the left-hand side, you see actually a company called Mega Robo that builds a giant robot. On the top is the PCR one I told you about, 120,000 PCR tests a day. On the bottom is a more fancier version of that that automates the wet lab. In the wet lab is where today the scientist or the technician uh, runs experiments, look, depending on results, runs more experiments. Now the experiments can be done by a robot. It's not about job replacement and saving money. It's about the scientists becoming more productive because 24 by 7, that obedient robot will run the program written by scientists. Yes, if you're studying science, you have to learn programming uh, in order to tell your robot what experiment to do. And what do you get? You get eight to 10 times more productivity because it's faster. Um, and there are other types of breakthroughs, small molecule, large molecule drug discovery, and so on. Lastly, we talked about new materials and, and, and applying those to green tech is a big area. We can make one molecule at a time, new materials that are cheaper, it can be applied in agriculture, and very importantly, new energy using hydrogen and, and sodium and other technologies will turn energy from a competition which used to measure who has the most endowment from natural resources like oil, but now it's gonna be who can make better solar panels and battery storage, and China is way ahead in this area. China has five of the top 10 battery companies in the world and eight of the top 10 uh, solar panels in the world. On the right-hand side, you see a typical Chinese battery company that's going beyond batteries. You see a picture there that is making a battery that is the chassis of a car that will reduce the weight of the car and the price of a car by 30 to 40% and allow the car to be charged once and run 1,000 kilometers. Imagine that future. It might be a battery company through their new reference platform that challenges automotive companies. So in summary, we're looking at in 20 years an opportunity for us to use these five revolutions that work with each other and have synergies with each other that will build a few whole new society in which there is enough for everyone and will have a chance to not only be liberated from routine work that machines can do for us, but also live in an era of plenitude where we will have enough resources and ability to create materials, labor, and energy uh, that will feed everyone on Earth and hopefully eradicate poverty and hunger. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your insightful and really enriching um, presentation. May I now call upon Ms. Ayushi Lahiri, our student moderator for tonight. Yes. Ayushi is a Tambusian, a second year um, engineering student. Oh, economics, excuse me. <laughs> um, so, without further ado, I will open up the Q&A session. I'd just like to remind students that there are two microphones on either side of the room. So, when you, um, before you begin asking your question, please introduce yourself, all right? And we would like to take one question at a time. So, if you do have a second question, um, you know, wait for your turn again, all right? So, please don't be shy and come to the mic mics, all right? So, without further ado, Ayushi. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for a very insightful um, speech about, I guess, where the future of AI really lies and how this is really going to be benefiting society. Um, so I think I will start off the Q&A session and then I will open it to the floor. So um, when you were speaking about how we could actually rely on AI, so for example, doctors. Doctors was the example that you'd used um, and how you'd have a sort of a handy assistant to kind of just pull data from the internet that previously um, doctors and scientists would have had to do manually. 
wouldn't there come a point where your AI becomes so much more advanced than the, the supposed people that they're helping? And if we reach that point, what do we do about the quandary of like the need to be intellectually engaged for so many people that are off these professions to kind of have you know, a job to do? I see. Very good question. Um, usually people ask about uh, job displacement, which is related to the question, but you went a step further about intellectual challenge. Um, so first on job displacement, um, I'll be clear that AI's first step, let's say in the next 20 years, it's going to do mostly routine work. So if you're truly doing an intellectually challenging work, then it probably would not be replaced by AI, nor would AI threaten your desire and opportunity to um, be intellectually challenged. Um, on the other hand, if, you feel you're inte if you're in a job and you feel intellectually challenged and yet AI is replacing your job, I would challenge you by saying maybe your job is not intellectually challenging. Right? All of us do many things that are intellectually challenging. Um, as an example, a radiologist, right? they do many things that are very intellectually challenged. They do research, uh, they do analysis, and they interact with others, they talk to patients. That's all very important. But the process of looking at an MRI scan and determining if it's cancer type A, type B, type C, well, I'm sorry, that is not intellectually challenging. We need to rethink what is intellectually challenging. Um, the fact that AI can do it means it's pretty routine because think about, think about facial recognition, right? I mean, it's a, I know it's a little bit controversial, but facial recognition is something we think people are better at because we, when we were babies, uh, we, were, we taught ourselves, we wired our neurons to recognize our parents' faces. So we ought to be really good at that. It ought to be innate because babies don't want to be um, separated from their parents. But yet, facial recognition systems can recognize three million faces with uncanny accuracy. And we, as humans, can barely do a thousand, right? So think about how much AI is pulling way ahead of us in an example of something we used to think to be good for humans and maybe intellectually uh, challenging. But now AI is millions of times better than us. But why do we think reading, pi watching pictures of tumors and labeling them is an intellectually challenging task when recognizing faces are not. It's actually not only not so intellectually challenging, uh, I would argue radiologists are being taught a bunch of rote and inaccurate and erroneous sometimes rules that don't generalize and that is imperfect um, and AI can do a better job. So, and I would, I'm not saying a radiologist work is useless. I'm saying the part of their job that is recognition of MRI is something that AI will do better. It's done better for some domains and will do better for more. So I think we need to look at this uh, uh, point and question with an open mind. And in fact, um, all of us do spend the day doing some percent routine jobs. Perhaps I do 30%, perhaps you do 40%. Uh, perhaps a factory worker does 90%, perhaps a radiologist does 60%. So I would look at the flip side to say that percent of time for which we're doing routine work, AI is being sent here to liberate us so we don't have to do them. And our 30%, 60%, 70% of our time can be freed to pursue more intellectually challenging things. And I would go as far as to say we might want to consider for a moment Anything AI can do for the next 20 years is relatively routine, and we should be doing, we should be better. We as humans should be doing things AI cannot do. And, and that's what makes our, I mean, if you think about people who, who believe their worth is in their jobs, right? We don't want to give people jobs that AI can do better because they'll just be disappointed and, uh, and have their um, you know, ambitions destroyed. We want people to aspire. We want people to happily give to AI to do things that AI is better at and to change their pursuit to things that AI cannot do uh, as a way to improve themselves and to challenge themselves. And it's a gift for more intellectual pursuits. And yes, a lot of your training may be thrown away. A radiologist spent years learning how to recognize tumors. 
but at some point in the next 20 years, not that soon, by the way, I'll be clear, uh, some point, in maybe in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, that skill set will become useless. Just as you know, switchboard operators who used to do this to connect telephone calls, elevator operators who used to have to see how to level elevators, right? Typists who used to have to type on typewriters, and many, many jobs that people spent uh, years or decades learning and perfecting became useless when technology innovation uh, does a better job. And that, to, uh, to, to us, needs to be a wake-up call that we shouldn't do that anymore. We should move on. We should not uh, try to suppress or slow down that progress or, or call it as a way to, to hurt us in any way, but we should move on because the, there's more opportunities for you to, to learn new skills that are more interesting and more challenging. That's a very interesting perspective because I think the, the majority of perspective that were presented in the media is that the AI is coming to take away all of our jobs. But you kind of um, speaking about how it's going to unlock new levels to human potential, how we might be able to kind of scale past what we consider now to be intellectual tasks, um, kind of opens very many new doors for people to kind of explore and grow in those areas. So thank you very much for that answer. With that, um, I would like to open the floor to any questions. Please remember to state your name. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your insightful sharing. Well, I have a question here. Uh, my name is Yong Yang. I have a question here uh, related to what Henry Kissinger, the former US Secretary of State, said in his book, uh, written, co he co authored with your former colleague in Google. He said, AI processes are pretty fast and satisfying. And there are some concerns about whether humans will lose the capacity for thought, I mean, say, deep thinking, uh, or what you call deep literacy, being able to think in the long term and spend time in thinking things out. I, I'm sorry, can you, is, is that a, I, I didn't quite catch the quote, can you Please say said, it again? AI processes are really fast and satisfying, again, we enjoy these kind of things, but there are some concerns whether humans will lose the capacity for thought and conceptualizing and perhaps uh, have the, and possess deep literacy. I got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I think this is a somewhat similar question. Um, and and I, I think um, on the one hand, I, I want to say that uh, AI is really not having any deep thoughts. AI is as magical as all the things I talk about. AI is merely a glorified spreadsheet. Right? It's got all this data in it, you push a button, magic happens. And, but magic happens because it's analyzed the data. When you're having a conversation with an AI, it might look real, but it's really not thinking the way we think. It's a different brain that collected all the things people ever said and typed in the whole universe and came up with a conceptual representation that tries to give you an answer that it thinks might be satisfactory. It's actually not through uh, deep thinking. So, um, so I, I don't think that's, that's uh, the way AI works. On the other hand, I will acknowledge Dr. Kissinger's point that AI is, from a user perception, more and more intelligent, right? AI can uh, have a conversation, synthesize text, um, and um, uh, read people's emotions, and perhaps create the appearance of having an emotion when it doesn't have one. And, uh, and that, that will progress. So I, I don't think we yet know what will happen as people continue to develop more human capacity and, and emotions and, and AI that appears to be more human. Um, my, my personal view is that in the next 10 years, let's say, uh, despite all the progress being made to masquerade as humans and appear to have deep thought and and empathy and, and emotions, uh, uh, masquerading as human is, 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 is really hard. Uh, it will, if you make one small mistake, people will distrust you forever. And people have also, I believe, an innate desire to interact with and reciprocate emotion with other people. I think to the transference of that to a robot appears to be unlikely in the short term. So, in other words, I think pretending to be a human with deep thoughts and affection and all that will be very hard to do in 10 years. And even if it does a decent job, 
uh, AI will tend to have catastrophic mistakes in the, because of the black box approach it takes. So people will probably not accept it because it, you know, imagine you have a robotic girlfriend uh, 10 years from now, and uh, it's wonderfully nice 99% of the time, but 1% out of the blue, it says something horrible. You'll probably not want to keep that robotic boy girlfriend, right? So that's what the AI will be like. So at some point, when will we get to 99.999999%? That will be a long time because it, it gets harder and harder. And then lastly, even if you got to close to 100%, uh, people will have a preference interacting with other people for many things, uh, for, uh, for love, for friendship, for caretaking, uh, for feeling good about something, and transference to the robot, I think, is unlikely. So all these things combined, I think Dr. Kissinger's fear are probably not within the next 20 years. And, um, and, and I think uh, also we as humans who really should spend more time making AI that as a tool that solves problems and helps us and is symbiotic with us and is built around for human good rather than emulating all the things to make a fake human. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Young Yang. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Jonah. Uh, my question is, uh, you've spoken before on, the, on restrictions in the Chinese information space. And uh, for the reasons that you've highlighted earlier, it's likely that Chinese AI companies will continue to rely on this Chinese information space, even if they uh, also harness data from outside. So are you concerned that Chinese AI might be less culturally sensitive? or more insular, uh, possibly even have racial or ethnic bias uh, compared to other AI. And given the place of AI within China's broader geo strategy, would that translate over to how China conducts itself as a whole? Okay, um, let me answer the bias question. I think uh, all AI systems, Chinese or American, uh, have inherent bias today. Uh, that bias comes from two parts in a small part, maybe by the programmer or the engineer who is not thoughtful or who is biased himself or herself um, and uh, carelessly makes mistakes or intentionally makes mistakes that leads to biased outcome. And I think that needs to be fixed by uh, enhancing education for AI engineers so that they're aware that with greater uh, power comes greater responsibility, that they need to be accountable just like the medical students have to swear the Hippocrates oath that life is sacred. The AI engineers need some kind of an oath that they must not uh, enhance, create, and um, grow bias and negative thinking in the society. And here are the set of tools they have to use to limit that. So that's a small part. The big part of the bias comes from the data. So, so the example used in, in the US is that uh, a particular tech company used an AI algorithm based on its um, um, interview results to recognize what kind of a job applicant would likely be successful in that company. And in their training the AI model, they used many more men than women. So the AI algorithm basically learned, at, among other things, that the company wants more men than women. Then it continues to send more pass through more men candidates and fewer uh, women candidates. And that's how uh, bias um, uh, happened in that particular case. In another very famous case showed that facial recognition worked well for, um, for Caucasians, but poorly for African Americans. And again, that's due to a lack of training data size uh, for that racial group. So what is important is for us to uh, make sure that data sets are reasonably balanced so that the, the bias in data sets doesn't lead to biased AI systems. And probably even worse example was a product called Microsoft Tay. It was a um, chatbot that was uh, allowed to talk to people on Twitter. Um, but pretty soon, because it's trained on Twitter talk, and you know how people talk on Twitter, it started to uh, you know, insult people and uh, make racial remarks and gender inappropriate remarks, and Microsoft had to take down the system. Microsoft didn't want to program a, a biased uh, system, but because it learned on the data, 
the Twitter data is really a problematic to learn from. So we really need to conduct research on how to cleanse and select data and also to filter the output so that it doesn't exhibit those behaviors. So those are the things that, that, that can, be, can be worked on. Um, and, and I think we need to have better tools for those of you who are in engineering. You know that the compiler, right? You write a program, a compiler runs through it. It will give you a few warnings that, well, hey, if you really run this program, here are a few bad things that could happen. Uh, run it at your own risk. Similarly, when you compile an AI algorithm, it could come back re after reading your data to say, hey, your data is imbalanced. You're likely to be discriminatory. You're likely to have insufficient data and be inaccurate and so on. So better tools, better training, uh, awareness of the problem in the data, uh, coming up with research that better cleanses the data so these problems are minimized. I think those are my, my, my answers to the question. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Maybe we'll do some from the side. Okay, um, uh, good evening, Dr. Lee. Um, I'm actually worried about receiving targeted scam messages in the future. So I mean, my, quest my question uh, probably is, how should we regulate AI or such aforementioned technology that you previously you mentioned from being used for malicious purposes? So about government regulation of AI? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do believe regulation is clearly needed because of so much potential externalities that could happen. But I would first say there are multiple solutions. Uh, we should not think of regulation as the only panacea. And it's certainly not a panacea. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. One way is to um, regulate AI by inventing new technologies. Think about when electricity was invented, people got electrocuted. There was no regulation preventing electricity going to the home, but what solved the problem was the invention of a circuit breaker. And when the internet was first connected to the PC, you were all too young, but uh, take my word for it, uh, it brought a lot of viruses to the PCs, but governments didn't stop connecting internet to the PC they, um, what solved the problem was antivirus software, right? So, and we now know that these work. When your email folders were crowded with spam, there was no regulation to, 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 to uh, eliminate spam. You can't do that. But, uh, you know, spam detectors, put them in the spam, spam folder. So these technologies should be permitted and encouraged to be developed and applied because they often are the best solution to problems caused by technology. Uh, secondly, uh, I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, there should be better tools and better awareness by the engineers so that they have fewer of these bad examples that, that, that would come out. Um, and, uh, and, and thirdly, I think there can be uh, third-party things that can eliminate bad things in AI. Rather, how do, you, how do you regulate fake news? Are you gonna find by Facebook a million dollars for each piece of fake, uh, fake news? It's very hard to regulate. Um, and it's somewhat um, not binary. It's a little bit you know, um, ambiguous whether something is uh, fake news or not. However, what a third party watchdog can do is they could have a fake news index. And then if a certain company lets that index go way up, then people will uh, discredit the company and not use their product. So that function could be used. It could be a third party watchdog. There could be an ESG a metric linked to responsible management by social network companies for fake news so that if they spread too much fake news, uh, some funds won't be allowed to invest in the company. That's another way. Um, and there are business model issues, right? We talk about, well, is Facebook really bad, intentionally bad by showing us all these negative content or you know, TikTok or YouTube? Uh, well, they're just, trying, just, they're just trying to make money by using AI to show things that we think we will uh, a click and like. But one of the big issues behind it is the advertising business model creates a um, unfortunate misalignment of interest between the giant company and us. What we want is get good information, learn and grow and be well liked and make friends. These are, the, these are our interests. But Facebook and YouTube and TikTok's interest is get more user minutes and make more money. So that create, and, and yet their business model being advertising causes them to show us more content that's addictive, and, but without regard for whether it's good for us or not. So that misalignment is a problem. Some business models are less prone to that problem, such as a subscription business model. 
For example, I don't hear anybody say Netflix is really uh, showing us fake news and hurting our kids and our, our minds because it's a subscription business model. If, if it does that to you, you, you unsubscribe, and that has a natural effect of putting Netflix out of business. So they don't dare not to respect users' interests and align with our interests. So all of these things, I think, in combination, need, we need to do a better job. Then when these things can't solve the problem, then we can take a, a, a regulatory approach. Um, and, and regulatory approach is, is very difficult because you, are, you don't want to micromanage a company's business, yet you want to protect the user. Um, and you also are dealing with multiple issues such as antitrust and um, um, monopoly maintenance um, and, um, uh, and just um, not managing your AI well. So, so far, uh, probably the government that has come out with the um, uh, largest set of restrictions and regulations that has achieved a fast effect is China. I'm not arguing it's better or worse. It's more of a fast execution of a set of things <clears throat> that it made the internet companies not do, thereby creating a more competitive environment and, um, and, and less opportunity to hurt the consumer. So it's somewhat effective, but it's also slowed down the industry, right? The um, European approach is a, an approach to focus on the user data and the sanctity of that and moving towards a way to, um, uh, moving towards a way uh, to protect the data so that large companies can't get access to it. So these are all the things you should consider. I should add one more. Uh, Web3 is argued as one possible way to, get to, to solve this problem by basically uh, using blockchain to publish everything. There is no data to take. There is nothing to abuse. Things are exposed in the open. Of course, that creates a whole new set of problems, uh, but it solves this one that we're currently talking about. So basically, my short answer summary is that there are a multiplicity of ways of dealing with externalities of AI, and regulation is one of them. We should do it, but we shouldn't think is really a panacea. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Li. Thank you for your question. Um, I think we'll do one more from this side. Uh, try and keep your questions precise. Um, we are running a little bit short on time. Please proceed with your question, and remember to state your names. Hi, my name is Li Ren, and um, first of all, I, uh, I just like to say I'm a huge fan of the book AI Superpower, and uh, a lot of young people are impressed by your career achievements and your involvement at Microsoft, Google, and Sinoventions. So m this, this may be a bit more personal question now, but my, my recall may not be perfect, but in AI superpower, you said that in 2013, you were diagnosed with stage four cancer, and it changed your frame of mind that money and fame weren't that important, and that what was important is family and relationships. So do you have career advice for like young people like us? Should we aspire to work as hard as you to achieve so much, or should we value like family and relationships more? <laughs> Yeah, uh, don't go to school and just go make lots of friends and uh, get a girlfriend, <laughs> right? No, 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 I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's age dependent, right? That was my realization at uh, age of 50 when I had cancer, that I felt I'd spend my whole life uh, optimizing my career. Uh, I felt I was like an AI algorithm, actually, that I was trying to optimize my, 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 my uh, wealth and fame, and, um, and, and, and it creates a, f a feedback loop and a very dangerous behavior, and it's um, obsessive, and it takes away from all the other things in your life. So what I realized when I had cancer was that when I thought I might only have a few hundred days to live, I didn't want to spend any one of those days working. I wanted to spend it with people I love and people who love me. I want to... Um, do things I enjoy. Uh, I want to satisfy my um, interests and hobbies and learning and curiosity. I didn't want to work anymore. So that my first 50 years were spent uh, with uh, an imbalance towards those things that were you know, fame and glory and wealth, but not with uh, real negligence towards the things that are really important to me. 
and and really it a book I read by Bonnie Ware was really resonated with me because she spent time with people in their death dying before they were dying and their largest regret was exactly the same as mine uh, spending way too much time uh, working spending way too much time obsessed on things that they don't really care about spending too much time caring about things the society wants them to care about and not doing the things they love not spending time with the people they love so this is something that is important but having said that i don't think everyone should remove their ambition and just um, you know spend all the time with family or friends um, i think there are smart ways to to spend is there's time to is a way to work hard and work smart. Um, similarly, there's time to be smart about how to maximize your time with your friends and families, right? Spend more quality time with your family, not measured by the hours, but by your um, focus and uh, true sincerity and, um, uh, and being thoughtful. It's not how many hours you spend. So young people should work hard, um, but you shouldn't spend all of your time working. You should balance. Uh, between work and other things that you're interested in. And as you get older, you might get more temptation to work even harder because you want to accumulate wealth and success and achievement and fame. But, but keep in mind, as you get older, your time becomes more limited. And it's actually time to focus more on work-life balance. So my, my advice to the young people is uh, think about the regret that I had when I was 50. What should you do now to prevent that regret when you're 50? Not uh, work less hard and uh, you know, spend all the time making friends and, and being with your parents and, and girlfriend, but balance the two. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, maybe we'll do some from this side. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, Dr. Lee. Thank you for your talk. My name is uh, Justin, and I'm a year two computer science student. Um, you mentioned in your talk that uh, you know, China is experiencing a rapid development in AI and uh, investment in quantum computing, and you yourself um, are heavily invested in this area as well. So my question to you is, how can we ensure that um, ethics and ethical guidelines are developing as fast as, uh, so as to keep up with these developments in AI? How to keep up with the advancements? Uh, yeah, uh, ethical, uh, ethics and ethical guidelines. How uh, you're you're a computer science student, and you want to know about how to make sure you're aware of these ethical issues? Yeah. OK. No, that's a great question. I, I think it's precisely the problems we see today with these large internet platform companies abusing AI is precisely because their engineers didn't ask your question, that their management said, quarterly result, get more user minutes, convert more revenue, and then that led to a cyclical negative behavior. So, um, so there are a number of publications and websites that you, you could and should look at. Uh, for example, uh, I think there are a number of um, organizations. Uh, I chair uh, World Economic Forum, um, Council on AI, and then there are a number of other AI for good um, organizations. And there are some excellent books and videos that have been created. Uh, one. One of my favorite people is uh, Tristan Harris, and he, he made the uh, Netflix video, Social Dilemma, and I think that's uh, really profound and very simple and anybody can understand. Um, and I would say also, if you're a computer science student, why, why not pursue um, ethical AI as your direction, right? I don't mean you know go into philanthropy and make no money. I'm, I mean, you could work on that compiler tool I talked about. What if you worked on the tool? What if you went to a company? What if you went to Google, right, or Facebook that worked on their tool, TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, uh, on a function that looks at all the AI, AI models being generated and issue warning messages for the AI that's creating bias or other problems, right? That kind of a career path, uh, you can be very successful, accomplish a great deal, um, and at the same time, uh, be a positive force for good in this area. Thank you. Thank you for the question. We'll do another one from the side. Hi, yeah, um, my name is Andre, uh, year one psychology student. Uh, just wanted to ask a little bit about, um, I think you mentioned just now about the reduction of the percentage, or at least replacing the percentage of routine work 
right? So that humans can be unlocked to do what is more intellectually challenging to us, right? I'm just wondering how can we convince people that are skeptical about AI to reconsider their relationship between uh, themselves and using, or how do you call it, uh, knowing that AI is in the background of most of the things that we do? Okay. Yeah, I think there are maybe two types of people in this category. Uh, first, those who are, who, are, um, who are aware, but they're fighting back and they're in denial or they're just anti-AI. And then there's the kind that are maybe not so knowledgeable, uh, but, but large percentage of their workload is actually quite replaceable. Yeah. So what can we do with both these group, two groups of people? Uh, with the first group of people, since they're knowledgeable, they've done some homework, I would try to persuade them uh, that AI is a tool. It's um, a spreadsheet on steroids. It's something we can control and manage. It's something we can use and make ourselves better. I would make analogies like um, uh, when Photoshop came out, uh, would artists feel, oh my God, that's taking away time from my, my, my canvas or my camera, my photography. Um, but if they viewed it as a tool, right? Today, artists and um, photographers uh, who don't use uh, Photoshop are at a great disadvantage. In fact, the ones who use Photoshop earliest got the greatest hit, you know, hit the ground running, right? And similarly, the writers who used typewriters and didn't move to word processing and Word and the computer uh, fell behind because much of their time was wasted um, you know, dealing with a mechanical tool that can't do error correction. So being the first to embrace technology gives you an advantage. And uh, uh, fighting back, uh, the, tell them to read about the Luddites uh, revolution, right? The Luddites, you know, they, they were against technology. They burned things. In the end, what happened? They lost their jobs. So they should spend the limited time they have on learning the skills that will obviously help your career rather than be denial or the naysayer uh, against, the, against the technology that is inevitable. They're definitely going to lose, right? If you're you know, a, a horse carriage, carriage driver in the, in the early uh, 1900s and you can do all the you know, Luddite things you want to do against automobiles, but it is a wave that cannot be stopped. So anyway, I would try these things and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. The second group of people, which I worry much more about, is the people who do currently routine work. And a significant percentage of a workload will be replaced by AI. And furthermore, their, the routine work they do is not a very skilled uh, type of routine work. And they're just unaware that this tidal wave is coming. And when it comes, several things will happen. They'll lose their job, suddenly they'll try to grasp at any straw, any job that they can find, also likely to be in uh, less skilled work. And then guess what? In a two or three years, their job will be replaced again. They will go down on this down, downward spiral, very worried about, about that. Uh, some uh, people talk about uh, universal basic income. Let's just give everybody money. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. The assumption that people who didn't know this tidal wave was coming lost their job and now we just give them money, they'll find the right direction. That's not likely. Most likely they'll need a lot of assistance and training. So I would um, say that societies and countries should put aside sizable training budgets and programs to help people identify jobs that are gonna stick around and retrain them in the right directions. And um, for example, it's pretty obvious, right? If you're an auto mechanic, that job's gonna be gone. The automobile of the future is going to be you know, elect electric and uh, autonomous vehicle. It's going to be like a phone on a with a giant you know, windows and, and wheels. Uh, the skills for, for the current auto mechanic is doomed uh, with or without AI, right? And job of a plumber is reasonably safe because that's a tough one. It has to do with you know, uh, when is, if I poke a wall and, and, and the, the the, 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 the lady who called me to do the work got mad, what do I do? And, and when do I feel confident to you know, break this up? And where's the, is it like a detective work? That one's hard to replace. And, and there are many, many such things. 
that it's not hard to draw a picture of the likelihood and time for displacement and give warning to those whose jobs are likely to be displaced and help train them in jobs that are likely to be sustainable. That's something that each of you can do if you know someone in such a profession and governments should do and universities should do and also vocational schools should stop training more, more aut you know, automotive um, mechanical re repair, right? They should put, they should have more plumber schools and even more robotic repair schools, right? And things like that. So, so there are many, many things that we can do for that group of people. And there's a giant group of people too. So the impact of society is huge. If we're seeing 20, 30 percent uh, people who lose their jobs for the next, you know, 10 in, let's say, in 10 years, uh, helping their uh, getting settled is, is a huge challenge. Um, and that education and training process really needs to start uh, as soon as possible. And, and lastly, I, f I think I forgot to mention, I happen to believe uh, one of the non-AI related jobs that will become more uh, in number and in, and, and in importance and in social stature are the human to human service jobs. So healthcare service, elderly care, um, and also other types of service jobs that require human-human interaction, um, including people in sales, people uh, in uh, being concierge or a tour guide, and many new professions that require the human interaction. I believe machines will not replace the need. In fact, it will accentuate and increase the need for human-human interaction, so we should guide more people in that direction as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Good evening, Dr. Lee. I'm Ming Jiang. I'm a computer science and math student. I'm interested in startups and tech, so I picked up your book a couple years ago, and I just wanted to say that I found it quite insightful. I'll try and keep my question short, but um, in your book and during your talk, you mentioned some of the benefits of uh, the US, where they had a lot of smart engineers, and they attract a lot of the best talent. But obviously, China is beating them in terms of having the amount of data, tougher engineers, and sorry, more data, tougher entrepreneurs, and a surplus of engineers. Obviously, I'm now convinced that China's leading the world and I'm applying for my visa as I speak. I'm just kidding. But uh, I understand that you definitely moved from the US to China in 1998, I believe. And um, you've obviously achieved a lot of success with the growth of China. But increasingly, China is looking inwards. And it does not seem like I'm going to get the same good chance if I do choose to move to China today. So I'm just curious, as a student who's interested in AI and startups, and I'm sure for some other people in the audience, like. What opportunities do you think there are for people that are not based in the US, not based in China? And what sort of advice would you give for students uh, in our position? Thank you. OK. Uh, I, th I think there are actually many opportunities. Actually, you're quite fortunate to be in Singapore, right? If you think about what big companies have lots of data and are beginning to make good progress on AI, well, you guys have TikTok, you have Grab, you have C. These are all great companies that equivalent companies to them five years ago were the ones that carry China forward, right? It's, if you think about all the great startups that were founded, many of the people came from the, the Baidu's, Alibaba's, and Tencent's. If those were the giants of China, you now have a few giants in Singapore. And, and furthermore, all three of these companies are global, which is incredibly important because if you're in a small country and all you do is work in a company that addresses your domestic local market, then you will never have big data. You will also not have a lot of users. Your company also won't be worth that much. So Singapore has made a giant leap forward by having multiple companies that have international presence with data from those countries that can accelerate their AI development. So my prediction is five years from now, if I were to come here as a VC, looking for companies to invest, uh, engineers in TikTok and um, Grab and um, C are the ones I would be talking to because they learned a great deal about using big data in AI companies with a lot of data. And they're the ones who might be doing the AI healthcare startup or the AI energy startup. Uh, that's exactly what happened in China. You can actually replicate that uh, uh, in, in a reasonable scale here because you're now training some of the people who are starting the Chinese startups in these areas. So I would say 
assuming you want to stay in Singapore, go work for one of these three companies or one of the other companies that have sizable data and excellent AI programs um, and learn a lot there. If you want to be an entrepreneur, then you can learn a lot and go leave and do a startup. If you just want a good place to grow your career, you can probably stay there for a long time because these companies are likely going to have good growth in the future. Thank you for the question. We'll do one from the side. Well, hi, doc Dr. Lee. Um, my name is Andre. Um, I'm a YouTube computer science student, and I'm also a Taiwanese, so you are definitely a figure that I looked up to. Um, so my question will be more related to um, your work right now, um, Sino Ventures in China. I would like to ask, what is your approach in investing in China right now, and how do you validate the technology in Taiwan? Uh, in, in sorry, in, ta in China right now. And also, I have um, another thing: is do you believe there is? Um, I'm so sorry. We yeah. can't have two questions, just one. I'm Wait, really sorry. Related. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we are now uh, investing 100% in deep tech in China, um, partly because I think. Uh, the success of Chinese AI companies gives us confidence and gives the entrepreneurs confidence. They can also be successful in other areas. And partly because looking at this geopolitical technology competition, it, it's problematic in that it's inefficient for the whole world to have two ecosystems. On the other hand, it's giving both countries, US and China, a lot of incentives to go push and accelerate its domestic technology ecosystem in the exact areas I talked about, quantum, semiconductors, uh, AI, robotics, uh, life sciences, uh, new energy, et cetera. So, um, so I think the entrepreneurs in both US and China in these deep te tech areas uh, may get a booster and an accelerator because their respective governments, due to the competition, will want to subsidize and help and push forward and accelerate. So these are kind of the exciting areas to be. If, if 10 years ago in China, mobile was the most exciting thing, if seven years ago, O2O was the most ex exciting thing, if three years ago, AI was the most exciting thing, I think now we've got a number of exciting things. So it's a different group of entrepreneurs who will tend to be deeper in technology, many with PhDs in technology, and uh, they want a VC to invest in them, help them find the business direction, um, and, and create great value. So, you know, one of my uh, most fun moments are finding really super smart people to work with and to find complex technologies and make them work for, 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 the, for everybody. So I feel that um, the uh, opportunity to transition in my company from investing in any company now to investing in just deep com tech company is a way to use and magnify my own personal skills and interests in a global picture that may be a little bit gloomy sometimes, but a silver lining is that deep tech may get accelerated and fourth industrial revolution dream may, may come true in both US and China and since my company and my work is in China, this is the uh, hemisphere and segment in which I'll uh, happily invest more years and hopefully create many more great um, tech uni unicorns. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, okay, uh, maybe all questions. All right, all right. Um, so do you wanna rapid fire your questions then? Do you want to uh, do that? I can take these four questions, but let's try to be be short. All right, perfect. That? Okay, then go for your question. Okay. Uh, hi, good evening, Dr. Lee. I am Dylan Chia, a year one computer engineering student, and also a huge fan of your work in AI. Um, so my question is on the tech rivalry between US and China. So recently, there has been escalations in the tech conflict, with US restricting the export of high-end NVIDIA GPUs and also EUV chips technology to China. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts on how this rivalry will play out between US and China, and whether it will end in peace or war. <laughs> I mean... Uh, okay, Techn technology war, I understand. Uh, 
I think we're definitely headed for greater competition, more intense competition. And um, uh, I, I think the, when US tries to say we're gonna make some products or technologies unavailable for China, it's a double-edged sword, right? Clearly in the near term, it will create a, an inconvenience, if not a serious um, negative impact. But in the long term, it's basically an open invitation for China to enter exactly the space in which US won't give the technologies. So the, the, the balls in China's court, right? Can China develop technologies that US will not give China anymore? And if it can, China's huge market will, will allow China to build companies that it couldn't be built before. Because imagine, can China five years ago create an NVIDIA? I would have said no. But if US is gonna say, we're gonna make the, this layer unavailable to China, if you want it, you get better build it yourself. Uh, and then maybe next year another layer, then effectively you're outlining a roadmap of saying, well, I'm gonna try to suffocate your access to my technologies. I dare you to create your own. So China is at the crossroads. If it successfully creates what it used to depend on US for these tech, it will accelerate its path to a superpower and maybe challenge US and compete in other parts of the world. But of course, if China doesn't succeed, then it will suffer as was intended by these policies. So these are uh, quite a double-edged sword. Um, the, as far as general GPUs, um, you can already see China now has a dozen companies developing GPUs. And um, so, so I, th I think um, the, the I th obviously the jury is still out. I can't make a prediction which way it will turn out, but I think it's an interesting uh, gamble that the US has chosen to take. And I think the ball's in China's court and we'll see how it plays out in the places in which it chose, the US chooses to play that game. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Let's take all three questions at one go. Oh. Um, hello, I'm Jules. Um, I, want, I would like to ask, uh, do you think the Chinese government will be using AI's, chi AI, China's AI superiority to further their political interests, um, both domestically and internationally? And like, if, if so, right, do you have like, any concerns about where it could be headed? I'm sorry, use it where? Um, like, do you think the Chinese government will be, will be using like, the China's AI superiority to further their political interests? And if you, have, if you think so, right, like, do you have any concerns about where this could be headed? All right, thank you. Good evening, I'm Ramu. Thank you very much for your talk so far, Dr. Lee. I would like to ask if you believe that there'll be equitable and universal access to uh, AI technology, besides from our two main AI superpowers, US and China, would first say the um, middle income countries be able to be and utilize these uh, technologies to address their challenges? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Dr. Lee. My question is a very simple one. How and why did you write a book? And what were some challenges of writing a book, which is best-selling? Thank you. All right, very different questions. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything about government policies, so I can't answer the first question. Uh, maybe you can invite another speaker from the Chinese embassy in the future. Um, on the, uh, uh, the, the second question, uh, I don't think US and China are dominating the technology access. Uh, yes, the Chinese US companies are leading companies in the technology areas, um, but the access to these technologies are widely available. Interestingly, the large companies, while they are sometimes very tough in their competition with each other, they realize that in AI, if one chooses to be um, closed, another company might compete to make it open. So Google's TensorFlow was pretty closed. So Facebook said, we're gonna make an open PyTorch, right? And then OpenAI's large language model was pretty closed. And Facebook said, well, we're gonna make an open source language model. So now these large companies are competing on who's more open. So it's a great opportunity for uh, university students and smaller companies because there's more open source stuff out there. Of course, there's already GitHub and, and the open 
uh, source code area. So I think you, you, you're in good shape, relatively speaking. When I was entering computer science, uh, everything was very close. So now you enter much more open in terms of technology access. On the, on the book, uh, the primary reason was I felt AI is so important, I want more people to understand it and have access to it. My first book, AI Superpowers, while it had a number of er uh, key points in it, one of the interesting feedback was people felt I made AI relatively accessible. So my question was, how can I make it even one further step even more accessible? And, and then one day we had an idea that what if we turn it into fiction? So AI 2041, which I didn't cover today, is actually 75% fictional. So I outline all these technologies and the roadmap for the next 20 years. And then I gave it to a science fiction writer, an excellent writer, Stanley Chen, and he turned it into 10 stories. And he and I iterated on the stories to make sure they're faithful to my technology predictions and that they're interesting to read. And after each book, I would write the analysis, explain how the technology works, what are the upsides, downsides, and how to deal with the downside. So it was uh, the most fun I've had writing a book because um, I, I love movies, I love science fiction. Even though I didn't write the stories here, it was fun being a part of it. And I'm hopeful there would be uh, a TV or a movie uh, coming out of this. Uh, that would, I would really enjoy uh, going to Hollywood um, to, to do that. So, and we're looking into that. So it was, uh, it was great fun. And it's great fun working with a creative mind. Uh, I also respect science fiction writers greatly. Uh, I both respect them greatly and also sometimes um, uh, 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 wish they would be different. Um, I wish they would be different because sometimes they describe, they like to describe uh, AI and technology in such dystopian context that it causes people to be negative. I'm a little frustrated by that. But I'm very inspired by them because almost everything you see today in the world that's an exciting technology that we're, we've now taken for granted, probably you can trace back to the roots of science, some science fiction that because those guys are more creative than us, us being the technologists, right? The, the writers are more creative. They could think further and put scenarios that both serves to inspire us as technologists to work towards that vision so we can hang our hat somewhere. So we're not working like when I was working on speech recognition. I wasn't working on it in a at, by th at that time, no speech recognition worked. I didn't work on the problem for the sake of publishing papers. I, I did it because I liked Star Trek. I liked how Captain Kirk you know, talked to, to, to the Starship Enterprise and how the agent was always very intelligent and uh, interactive and fun. And I dreamed that one day I could make that kind of capability happen. And, and it did happen. And, uh, and many other people uh, talked to me about how they traced, the, many other AI scientists tell me they were inspired by some science fiction, which gave them the context and scenario and inspiration and the belief that if they took their research to fruition, they would impact the world in the way that a particular science fiction did. So that's why I have tremendous um, respect and very thankful, very inspired, but sometimes a little frustrated by science fiction. And it was fun to be now a pseudo science fiction author, even though my co-author wrote all of it. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the great conversation. Thank you, Ayushi. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for fielding these wonderful questions. Um, may I now invite Mrs. Lim Hui Hua, Rector of Tembusu College, for her closing remarks. I think this can go on forever, right? <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee, for a wonderful, mind-blowing session. Um, thank you for taking us painstakingly through the evolution of AI, you know, and as well as pointing us to all the different possibilities, I mean, uh, which are really mind-boggling. Thank you for reinstating our motivation so that we do not have to be afraid 
of what AI potentially can do, but uh, in terms of how we can be a participant in all the different developments and possibilities that AI will bring to our lives. So thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your time. Uh, let's show our appreciation. Thank you, Mrs. Lim. We have come to the end of the session. I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, you may take your leave. <laughs>